Infectious diseases are scary no matter where you live. But in rural America, some are more common due to exposure to livestock, ticks, and even rodents. Tonight, we'll look at the life-altering diseases that you could be at risk for and how to protect yourself and your family. Good evening and welcome to Rural America Live. I'm Christina Loren. We want to help you stay as healthy as possible. So tonight we're joined by a panel of experts live from the University of Nebraska Omaha to discuss how you can lower your chances of contracting an infectious disease. Joining us tonight is Dr. Jeffrey Gold, Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center, and Dr. Mark Rupp, UNMC Professor and Division Chief of Infectious Diseases. Thank you both for joining us tonight. Well, thanks for having us, uh, Christina. Tonight's an yet another opportunity to talk about health and wellness uh, in the rural uh, communities. Specifically tonight, we're going to talk about infectious diseases. These are diseases that are spread uh, either from farm animals, uh, through crops and dust, uh, that cause infections uh, in people who are at higher risk because of their work and their lifestyle uh, in rural communities. We're very fortunate to have a true expert with us tonight. Absolutely. We can't wait to talk to him. We're in the heat of the summertime. Many rural Americans will be spending time outdoors, if not working, enjoying recreational activities, exposed to animals and insects. Dr. Rupp, this is your first time on the program. Tell us a little bit about yourself and what sparked your interest in infectious diseases. Well, Christina, thanks so much for having me on the program. I'm delighted to be here, and I'm really looking forward to talking about some of these infectious diseases that are more prevalent in the rural environment and the things that your viewers may come into contact with. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, you know, my father was a geologist, and we moved around the western part of the United States. I eventually moved to Houston, where I finished my high school and college and medical school, and then uh, left uh, Houston to go out to Virginia for my training before I came here. And I think my uh, you know, interest in infectious diseases was just a natural curiosity about the uh, infectious microbes and the diseases that they cause. And again, I'm hoping that I can give a little bit of that information to your viewers this evening. We are you know, Mark, before it. we get into it, uh, it might be helpful for our audience to understand what an infectious diseases doctor is and why you are so excited to pursue that field because I'm going to bet many of our audience uh, probably have never had a consultation with a infectious diseases or with an ID doctor. So uh, what would you want them to know about that? Well, an infectious disease doctor is a physician that has gone through training in internal medicine and then has spent additional training in infectious diseases. So internal medicine training is three years after medical school. Infectious disease training can be anywhere from two to four more years. And all of those folks are training to recognize infectious diseases, to learn about the microbes that cause them. And then importantly, after making that diagnosis, what's the important uh, treatment to put them on that's most effective and efficient? And then perhaps just as important, how do we go about preventing those infectious diseases? Well, this is great. a great topic tonight. We are so excited about it. We know that our viewers have lots of questions and stories to share, and we are going to open up our phone lines in just a little bit. But let's get right to it. Rural farmers and ranchers and those who like to hunt or enjoy the outdoors this time of year, they may actually have a greater risk of diseases that are spread from insects like mosquitoes. So let's go ahead and start with the leading cause of mosquito-borne disease. What do we need to know about West Nile virus? Yeah, Christine, so your viewers who are more frequently in the rural areas that, um, you know, are out in the fields and, and in the woods um, are going to be more likely exposed to these things that we call vectors. So these are insects that transmit infectious diseases from animal reservoirs to humans. And as you mentioned, one of the really important ones is West Nile virus. Now, West Nile virus is a great example of an infectious disease that, um, you know, we thought of as sort of an exotic uh, infection that back when I was in training, I thought I would probably never see. But it got introduced into New York in 1999, and then from those very humble beginnings spread rapidly across the rest of the country and is now one of the most frequent vector-borne diseases that we see in the United States, tens of thousands of cases per year. Now what your viewers want to know about West Nile is that most people who develop this infection is actually subclinical. So about 80% of the people who get bitten by the mosquito and have the transmission of West Nile virus are totally asymptomatic. 
there's about 20% of folks who will have what we call West Nile fever. This is where you get fevers, headaches, muscle aches, oftentimes a rash, obviously uh, occurring during the summer when the mosquitoes are active, and then typically will go away on its own after three or four or five days. Now the people that we really worry about are the unlucky one in every about 150 people who acquire this disease that develop neuroinvasive disease. And neuroinvasive disease means that the virus attacks the nervous system, the central nervous system, and it can affect the brain or the cranial nerves or the meninges and cause really serious disease, oftentimes resulting in death, unfortunately, or in permanent disability. So even those folks who recover from West Nile neuroinvasive disease oftentimes have paralysis or weakness or ongoing problems that they may never get rid of. Wow. Dr. Gold, how much West Nile do you see at UNMC? Well, unfortunately, Christina, <clears throat> our part of the country is one of the areas that West Nile has become more common in. And, uh, you know, Mark can give us the exact numbers, but particularly now after the flooding, and I think we talked about it on the show that was focused on the flooding that's occurred here in the upper Midwest, uh, is a particular concern in our farming and ranching communities. I mean, as we all know, mosquitoes love to live and breed in standing water. And so anything that increases the amount of standing water uh, that is available uh, in rural or urban communities, for that matter, uh, increases the frequency of uh, mosquito-borne diseases. So roughly uh, in our part of the country, Mark, uh, how would you say the numbers go this year or last year? Well, you know, every year we do see cases of West Nile virus uh, at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And interestingly, the real epicenter of West Nile virus has been in the middle part of America. So Nebraska, South Dakota, North Dakota, Colorado, that's where we've really seen the most cases of infection. And again, so much of it is subclinical that we don't really know the total number of people who develop this disease, but we see dozens of cases every year within the state. And unfortunately, again, in the very young, in the very old, and in the immunosuppressed, this can be a very, very serious disease, uh, resulting in either loss of life or permanent disability. Mm. You know, let's talk about prevention now, because it seems like there are some simple ways to prevent West Nile. Talk about what we need to keep in mind at our homes and when we go outdoors. Yeah, Christina, that's a great question and a great topic. And because these mosquitoes, you know, generally live within a, a relatively uh, small area, you can do a lot within your local environment to kind of mosquito-proof it. Uh, this disease is spread by Culex mosquitoes that generally don't fly more than a few hundred yards from where they're hatched. And so if you're able to drain uh, stagnant water, either from you know, water fountains or overturned flower pots or old tires that are sitting out there in the yard, um, you can do a lot to decrease the number of mosquitoes that you might get exposed to. Now obviously it's harder to do that if you're in an area with a large amount of water or as Dr. Gold related, if you're in an area that's been flooded, that water's gonna be there a while. It's gonna be a really um, good place for mosquitoes to breed. Now, if you have already taken those steps where you're getting rid of stagnant water and the places where mosquitoes breed, then the next thing you wanna do is to try to keep the mosquitoes from biting you. Now, this mosquito is one that spreads mostly in the evening hours, and so when you're out in the evening and at night, wear protective clothing, long sleeves, uh, put on some DEET-containing uh, insect uh, repellent, and that'll really help as well. Uh, there's a few other things that you can kind of look for. Oftentimes the Public Health Service will tell you when West Nile virus is active in your community. And then because certain bird populations are so vulnerable to West Nile virus, when it comes into a community, oftentimes you'll see dead crows and dead jays because they're so susceptible to this virus. I used to think of those as kind of nuisance birds, but now when I see crows in my yard, um, I'm really happy because it means that West Nile's probably not in the vicinity. Mm. Excellent tip. I think that's something we all take for granted. Great. Now, what are some of the more common tick-related illnesses that rural Americans need to be aware of? For instance, one that keeps hitting the news is Lyme disease. Talk a little bit about that. Well, Lyme is a very important tick-borne disease. Uh, there's uh, several of these that I'd like to talk about this evening, but clearly uh, Lyme disease is one that people need to be aware of. This is uh, spread by what we call the black-legged deer tick. And those ticks are found throughout many parts of the eastern part of the United States. 
Uh, the place where we see Lyme disease being transmitted by those ticks, however, is geographically fairly limited. So all along the eastern seaboard in the New England and mid-Atlantic states, and then there's another very hot pocket in and around the Great Lakes. So Minnesota, Wisconsin, even now part getting down into our area of the country in the northern part of uh, Iowa, we're seeing uh, uh, Lyme disease transmitted. Now over time, the tick populations and the reservoirs that uh, serve as, as, as the reservoir for these infections do change, and so people do need to be aware of that. So even though you know, it, it started off uh, aptly named in Lyme, Connecticut, uh, there are lots of areas in the country where we're now seeing Lyme disease. Now it's spread by the tick, uh, and this is an exotis or, or a black-legged tick, as you can see here on the graphic. And you'll notice how small they are. So that's a, a dime that's in the background. And you'll see the lymph and the, and the larval forms of these ticks are extremely small. It makes it a little bit um, less easy to detect the tick bite. Now, one thing that uh, your viewers will want to know is that generally this is not in a very efficient transmission from the tick to the human. And only after the tick has been attached for about 24 to 48 hours do we actually see transmission. So as we'll come back to, this is a great uh, thing to know because if you can uh, take that tick off uh, before it's been embedded for you know, one or two days, you can prevent the transmission of the disease even though the tick has uh, bitten you. Wow. So the disease itself uh, generally has an incubation period of somewhere around maybe seven to 10 days. And generally, people have been in one of those areas where we have the, uh, the Lyme disease being spread. So again, the Great Lakes area or over on the eastern seaboard. And then it presents with a constellation of symptoms, usually fevers, headaches, some muscle aches. And then there's a very characteristic rash that's seen in somewhere around 80 to 85% of patients with Lyme disease. Uh, it has a technical name, it's called erythema chronica migrans, and it's a large red spot, usually several inches in diameter, oftentimes sort of a bullseye lesion with a central area of clearing that's at the site of where the tick uh, bit you. And then oftentimes you'll get satellite lesions around that in other areas of the body. This is a very characteristic presentation. Uh, doctors need to be very much in tune to it, and now your viewers are as well. And if they have that kind of a constellation during the summer months, they really should present for evaluation to see if they have Lyme disease and appropriate treatment, because at that early stage, it is very treatable. Now, if you are to go home after, say, hunting or spending some time outdoors in thick brush and you do find a tick lodged into your skin, what's the proper way to remove that? Obviously you want to get it out of there as soon as possible, but what do we need to keep in mind when we're getting rid of that tick? Well again, you, you want to remove that tick uh, carefully and you want to do it appropriately so that you're not actually increasing the risk of disease. Uh, don't do the old uh, wives tale of taking a lit match and applying it to the, the rear end of the tick and hoping that it'll extract itself. Instead, as the graphic shows, you want to use some fine tweezers to grasp the tick down as close to the mouthpiece as you can. So you want to get it right next to your skin and then gently and firmly just pull that tick out slowly with gentle pressure and then you'll remove that whole tick. Uh, you want to dispose of that tick then. Uh, you don't ever want to crush it between your, uh, your fingers because all that does is uh, get those infectious agents onto your skin and cause further problems. So just uh, slow, easy, gentle pressure as you take that off and then dispose of that tick. Okay. Mark, we get asked all the time about immunization. Patients come in and say, can I be immunized for Lyme disease or can I be immunized for West Nile that we spoke about a few minutes ago? And uh, do you have some thoughts about that? Because uh, to the best of our knowledge, there are no vaccines currently available. Is that right? That's correct. Uh, they did have a, a Lyme vaccine that was available for certain animal populations. Um, they don't have that now for humans. Um, they did do some trials. And uh, again, there is no commercially available Lyme disease vaccine now. The good things for the viewers to realize is that at those early stages, it's a very treatable illness with two or three weeks of a variety of oral antibiotics. Oftentimes we use a tetracycline type antibiotic or a penicillin type of antibiotic, but there's several other classes of antibiotics that can be used as well. Where we get into some confusion is when that initial presentation is missed and then you can have other 
illness that can be related to Lyme disease further down the, the trail. So weeks, months, or maybe even years later, you can get arthritis, uh, sometimes some neurologic symptoms or a carditis. One of the, uh, the real hallmarks of this disease is a second degree heart block, or sometimes you'll see what's known as a Bell's palsy, where you can actually get a facial uh, paralysis uh, due to later stages of Lyme disease. Again, when those are recognized, and there's some good uh, blood tests that can be done to diagnose Lyme disease, those are also treatable illnesses. So that's the real you know, word of optimism for viewers, is that this is a treatable disease when recognized. Can it actually be spread through breast milk or blood transfusion? Well, you know, maybe in its very acute stage, you might see some transmission like that. I've not uh, read about cases where, where that is at all a common way of being spread. Um, you know, very, very initially, when you have this organism, is it called a Borrelia? Uh, it can be in the bloodstream. So maybe there's a case report or two of it being spread in that manner. But by far and away, uh, the only way that this disease is picked up is through ticks and not from person to person spread. Okay. You know, one of the one of the big stories that we've heard a lot about people who do find that they have Lyme disease, often they have great difficulty in getting that diagnosis. Talk about why that's the case and how doctors are working to fix that. Well, um, again, because this is a little bit of a tricky disease, you can have uh, folks with different kinds of clinical presentations that feel like they have Lyme disease. And there's probably more of a fear of Lyme disease than, than the disease is actually present. And you can get led astray if you do testing inappropriately. So again, in somebody who doesn't have that kind of symptomatology that I have already described, and isn't coming from an area where you see transmission of Lyme disease, then if you do those tests, you're much more likely to actually have a false positive test than a true diagnosis of Lyme disease. So that's part of the problem, is that because it can masquerade as other diseases, some folks have this fear of Lyme disease, you do a test, you get a false positive, and then you go down, unfortunately, ineffective and inappropriate treatment. And that's something that unfortunately we do see sometimes. And what about false negatives, Mark? Those are not uncommon either, is that correct? Early in the disease, that's absolutely true. So when somebody presents with that initial skin uh, lesion as well as the clinical constellation, if you do testing at that stage, oftentimes it's negative. And so what we would do with those patients is if we really wanted to clinch that diagnosis, you might repeat that test six weeks or eight weeks later when you have an antibody response at that point. But again, for the most part, people are presenting with pretty clinical uh, characteristic signs and symptoms um, that can be treated at that point and can be diagnosed with uh, good, uh, good blood tests. Okay, boy, we love having the professionals from UNMC on. You offer such valuable information to our viewers, life-saving information. We're going to pause for just a moment, going to break, but we want to open up our phone lines to you tonight. Maybe you have a question about infectious diseases or you know someone who's experienced one firsthand. If so, give us a call with your questions. Share your experiences with us tonight. The number is 877-731-6733. Again, 877-731. 6733. We've got a lot more to talk about. Stay with us. More Rural America Live with UNMC right after this. Welcome back to Rural America Live. Tonight, the experts from the University of Nebraska Medical Center are here to talk with us about the risk of infectious diseases across rural America. Remember, you're an important part of this show, and we want to hear from you tonight. Give us a call at 877-731-6733. Are you concerned that you may be at risk for an infectious disease in your part of the country? Maybe you know somebody who's contracted one while working or spending time outdoors. Join the discussion, 877-731-6733. We want to make you a part of this conversation tonight. Once again, our panel of experts join us live from the University of Nebraska, Omaha, UNMC Chancellor Dr. Gold and Dr. Rupp, Professor and Chief of the Division of Infectious Diseases. We were talking about tick-borne illness before we went to break. Let's continue that conversation now and talk a little bit about STARI. 
Yeah, Christina, um, what I want your viewers to realize is though we've covered Lyme disease, which is primarily on the East Coast and around the Great Lakes, but pretty much anywhere you live in America, if you're outdoors and getting exposed to ticks, you can pick up other tick-borne diseases. One of these we call STARI, which stands for Southern Tick-Associated Rash Illness. Now this is seen in Missouri and Arkansas, Kansas, uh, some of those areas. It looks a lot like Lyme disease, and so patients will present with a rash that's very characteristic of Lyme, along with those fevers and muscle aches, but it's not caused by the same bacterium that causes Lyme. Uh, Lyme disease is caused by Borrelia burgdorferi. We don't know what causes Stari, but it seems to look a lot like Lyme, and we oftentimes treat it with tetracycline antibiotics or other antibiotics. Uh, penicillin antibiotics, and it tends to go away just like Lyme disease does, but it doesn't have the chronic manifestations that uh, Lyme disease has. So again, it's one of those diseases that you can pick up from a tick that uh, your viewers need to know about if they're living in that portion of the country. Now other ticks can spread a variety of other infectious diseases. So uh, we have what's known as Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, and even though it's called Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, the actual place where you get the most of it is along the south, sort of central part of the United States. So Arkansas, Missouri, on through Tennessee, Kentucky, and then over into Virginia and the Carolinas. That's where we actually see more Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever than any other place in the, in the oh. country. Um, you all can see that in, in our area of the country as well. So, um, you know, this is a disease that can be very serious. So during the summertime, the constellation of symptoms that you see are bad headaches and fever. And then about 85 to 90 percent of people, two or three days into their illness, will develop a, a, what we call a petechial rash. So small little pinpoint red dots that typically start on your hands and on your ankles and then spread centrally. Now this is a disease that when recognized and treated appropriately with tetracycline antibiotics, almost everybody does well. But unfortunately, if it's not recognized and not treated, there's probably about one to 2% of people who actually can die from Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. Wow. So this is a disease again, summertime, headaches, fevers, with a rash, you're gonna want to go see your physician. As soon as possible. Okay, we actually have a caller joining us from Arkansas tonight. Danny, you are first up. Thanks for joining the conversation. Go right ahead. Okay, my question is, I had uh, Rocky Mountain spotted tick fever in uh, 2009. was in the hospital, very sick with it before they figured out what I had. And then they gave me doxycycline and cured the... Uh, Yeah, this is Danny from uh, Rector, Arkansas. Huh? Was is it? Um, has it been difficult for you to consume red meat after you had that Rocky Mountain spotted fever, Danny? I've had uh, yeah, I've had uh, another, another tick bite in 2014, and now I'm allergic to red meat. Mm. What I'd like to know yeah, from that... the panel is. Can I get, uh, excuse me? Nope, you know what, I think you're listening to your television. So um, you might wanna just step away from the television set if you can, and, and go ahead and ask your panel. We have the experts on just for you tonight, so go ahead and ask your question whenever you can. Okay, what? But you know, Danny, we, we, like know. we do understand. We do understand the, uh, you know, the long-term consequences of Rocky Mountain spotted fever. And although most people are successfully treated, there's a very small percentage that will develop some long-lasting effects. And maybe, Mark, uh, you could help Danny better understand that. Yeah, so what Danny is describing is a really interesting phenomenon that's just been characterized relatively recently, and that is a meat allergy that is developing after the bite of the Lone Star tick. So this is an Amblyoma americanum tick. And apparently it can transmit antigens that your immune system will then recognize that they share with meat of mammals. And so people can eat fish, they can eat uh, chicken or other fowl, but when they eat m mammalian uh, meat, they will get an allergy. And unfortunately, it can be relatively difficult to recognize because 
as opposed to most allergies for food that occur fairly quickly after you eat, mm -hmm. uh, this can occur hours uh, sometimes or even 12 or 24 hours after you've consumed the meat. So there's a long delay time and people don't really pick up on the fact that they're allergic to the meat. But it presents just like any other allergic reaction. You actually get uh, a stuffy nose and sneezing. You can develop a skin rash, uh, very much like al other allergic reactions. And so this is in the setting of beef or pork or, or other types of, of meat dishes and it doesn't depend on how it's prepared or uh, or where the or whether it's beef or pork or other sources it's that, just... that's absolutely correct um, as far as I know and I'm not an allergist uh, an expert in this but it appears to be only due to mammalian um, meat and uh, again if you have somebody who's telling you that they uh, develop a rash and a runny nose and sneezing and allergic type reactions hours after they eat red meat but they're able, able to eat chicken or fish uh, that sounds pretty characteristic of that. And that's even after successful treatment of the, uh, of the tick-borne disease. It could be, yes. It's a very different uh, phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And then there's another disease that I wanted to touch upon that we call um, ehrlichiosis or sometimes anaplasmosis. So ehrlichiosis is described in the Arkansas area. And one of the reasons I like infectious diseases so much is I, is I have a little bit of bent towards uh, history. And oftentimes the names of diseases are uh, around historical events or the people who describe them. Or in this case, with uh, Ehrlichia chaffiensis, it's named after Fort Chaffee in Arkansas where this disease was first described. And so uh, what we call ehrlichiosis is Rocky Mounted Spotless Fever. So if you remember the constellation of symptoms for Rocky Mounted Spotted Fever with rash and headache and fever, just take away the rash and now you have ehrlichiosis. So again, headache and fever during the summer, probably best to go consult a medical attention because this can also be a serious disease. Uh, very similarly, a disease that we call anaplasmosis, you get that up more in the Great Lakes region that's uh, spread by the ticks in those areas, uh, presents very similarly. Rash, headache, not, I mean, uh, without the rash, but with the headache and the fever, sometimes a falling of your white blood cell count and platelets uh, can be a very serious disease as well. So the long and the short of it is that ticks are bad and that uh, <laughs> we need to be very careful to uh, monitor them, uh, particularly on our kids who play outdoors uh, or people who are working outdoors. And when uh, we find one, we have to be very careful and remove it appropriately. Absolutely. And so that brings in some of the preventative things, just like we talk with mosquitoes. Uh, when you're outdoors wearing some long sleeve clothing, using the insect and the tick repellents. And then, as you mentioned, uh, particularly for people who aren't able to do a tick inspection, young children, you're going to want to do that and make sure that they haven't uh, uh, contracted those ticks. Yeah, you know, dogs as well. We love our animals across rural America, and sometimes they can go out into the thick of the brush. They come back in. What do you do if you find a tick on your dog? I mean, how concerned do we need to be? What's the proper protocol when that happens? Christina, great question. And so there are so many, uh, you know, pet owners out there, and they are out tromping around in the woods and on the trails, that if you find a tick embedded in your pet dog, you want to use the same technique, and that is remove it with tweezers. You don't want to, um, you know, take the tick and crush it uh, with your hands because, again, that uh, causes the, the microbes to get on your hands, and then you can easily inoculate that into yourself. So uh, getting rid of that tick, just like we described, is the best way to go. You know, some people say you should save the tick and put it in a little plastic bag or a little container and, uh, and show it to somebody, such as your physician or nurse in, or an emergency room. Do we still recommend that, or are those days long gone? Well, I, I think in certain Not areas... Not that I have any, by the way. In certain areas, uh, it would be helpful to know what kind of tick um, had caused the bite. Um, obviously, also knowing how long it had been attached, potentially. Uh, is it engorged? Has it been there for two or three days? Those would all be useful things to go into to your physician or medical attention. If you have the tick, oftentimes it's pretty easy to discern one type of tick from another and then potentially know what sort of diseases that can transmit. Um, I'm probably speaking out of turn, but there may be county extension services that mm -hmm. would also sure. have an entomologist attached to them where they could take a picture of it and send that information into a, a, a real expert that would be able to identify that tick. So save it if you can. Sure. Okay. And then there's a few other tick-borne diseases that we could also mention. Again, pretty much anywhere you live in the country, uh, you can have tick-transmitted diseases. Uh, tularemia would be one of those diseases. Uh, there's a disease over on the eastern seaboard called Babesia. 
Um, all of these are diseases that we need to know just a little bit about. And again, as Dr. Gold said, in general, ticks are bad. Try to avoid them. He also says something that resonates with me. If you see something, say something. If you notice you have those symptoms, you want to call your medical practitioner as soon as possible. Okay, we're going to go back to the phones. Jamie from Oklahoma, thanks for joining the conversation. You are on with the experts from UNMC. Hello, thank you for having me. Um, I've kind of got, there is lots of information about getting Rocky Mountain tick fever. I got it, at, I'm pretty sure, in 2014. Um, and I truly think that it just, it shows up and messes with me. It rears its ugly head from time to time. Um, there's lots of information about getting tick fever, but there's not a lot of information about living with it. So, uh, it, uh, what my question, well, one of them is, it, is this always going to mess with me, basically? I mean, you know, I'm in the middle of Oklahoma, and ticks happen. They, they just do. And, you know, not everybody's going to call on, on anything. And luckily, when I, when, I, when I got my tick fever, luckily, right about that same time, I got put on do doxycycline. And it wasn't until later when they did a, a blood test, you know, the, the good blood test where they test everything, is that it popped up. But now I, I almost get, like, flares where I, I run fever, I get achy, and then they go away. Is that normal? So, so Jamie, uh, that's, that's a great question uh, because obviously you had a good diagnosis, it sounds like, and, uh, and a good course of treatment uh, for the Rocky Mountain spotted fever. And, uh, and, and now you're still having symptoms. So Mark, what about that? Are there long-term sequelae or does one question the diagnosis or the efficacy of the treatment? Uh, what would you recommend? Well, for the most part, it sounds like uh, Jamie had a diagnosis established, was treated appropriately. We don't really think of there being chronic forms of Rocky Mounted Spotted Fever or some of the other tick-borne diseases. Obviously, we've already talked about Lyme disease. And so I would be a little bit hesitant to um, rest uh, assuredly on there being any kind of uh, intermittent sequelae from that diagnosis of Rocky Mounted Spotted Fever. Um, I would suggest that she seek medical attention uh, talk about her symptoms and see if there wasn't something else going on. Uh, there are a number of, uh, you know, pretty easy screening tests that uh, physicians can do just to see if she has some inflammatory markers that are elevated, uh, some other abnormalities that might give clinicians a clue as to which direction to head. Uh, she could have some sort of inflammatory disease or autoimmune disease or what have you. But we don't really think of Rocky Mounted Spotted Fever as causing long-term intermittent sequelae like that. So this dates back to 2014, I think Jamie said. That's, you know, a good five years ago. So look for something else is your advice. Um, I think that that would be a prudent course. Okay, that leaves a line open for you to join the conversation. 877-731-6733. Our phone lines are lit up tonight. This is a hot topic. Kathleen from North Carolina, you are our next caller. Go right ahead. Yes, um, my dad, he had congestive heart failure in 2001. And I was wondering, is it uh, long-term memory loss or is it short-term memory loss? Uh, if you do, you know, have this disease, um, is it just something that, you know, um, just go away or is it something that's going to be prolonged? Well, Kathleen, congestive heart failure is not usually uh, caused by an infectious disease. It can be. There are certain, actually, types of uh, farming and ranching infectious diseases that will cause uh, a weakening of the heart muscle, uh, which, uh, as you appropriately name, is, is congestive heart failure. But it usually doesn't cause direct memory losses unless it gets so severe uh, that it really impairs the individual they lose sleep, their overall activity level goes down, and they're generally either malnourished or weakened uh, as a direct result of the weakening of their heart. Now, as, uh, as Dr. Rupp has told us, there are both uh, tick-borne, mosquito-borne, uh, fungal diseases that have a very specific effect on the heart and can cause either short-term or long-term uh, weakening of the heart muscle. And what would be some of the classic examples of that, Mark? Yeah, so I, I think that that's a, a very interesting question, and I guess uh, one of the things I would point out is that if the congestive heart failure is uh, severe enough to really cause 
uh, decreases in the, uh, the heart's capacity to deliver red cells and oxygen to any of the end organs, you could potentially have damage from that that could potentially manifest as some sort of uh, neurologic uh, compromise. Again, any illness that is very serious, uh, as we see in patients who are in the ICU, and so again, I don't know if uh, this person's uh, father was so sick that they were in an intensive care unit and had the sequelae from just being that ill that is somewhat poorly understood, but oftentimes we do see uh, long-term chronic sequelae that sometimes can manifest as uh, just some, some memory problems, uh, just uh, a decrease in somebody's overall fitness, uh, their stamina, et cetera. So uh, there's a, a lot of concerns, and I, I certainly don't pretend to uh, be all knowledgeable about these things. I think there's a lot that we have yet to learn in medicine. And I think, Kathleen, there are also some medications that particularly in combination when used for congestive heart failure can cause some neurologic symptoms as well. So that's a good thing to go back and uh, ask your doctor uh, or the health professional that provides your care about as to whether there is anything that can be done. The good news is usually there is. All right. Well, just like that, we have to take another break, but we still have your phone calls waiting. We want to hear from you tonight, 877-731-6733. There's still time for you to join the conversation. We're going to be taking more of your calls. We know this is a hot topic. When do you get a chance to ask doctors your direct questions? Well, that's what UNMC does for us here on Rural America Live. We're going to have more with UNMC right after this. Welcome back to Rural America Live. Tonight, our focus is on the risk of infectious diseases across rural areas and how to prevent your chances of contracting one. We want to hear from you. Call in with your questions for our panel of experts from UNMC 877-731-6733. Have you or someone that you know contracted an infectious disease while working on the farm or just being outdoors? If so, share your story with us. Again, that number is 877-731-6733. You can call in with your questions as well. Our phone lines are now open. Now, before we go back Back to the phones, we want to talk about diseases that can spread through handling or breathing in dirt or dust. These would be important to ag workers, obviously, but anybody as well who gardens or does landscaping. That's correct, Christina. So these are important diseases that um, clearly can be spread by inhalation, and they're really based upon the geography. And so we have a disease that's called histoplasmosis that is primarily seen all up along the uh, Ohio, Missouri, Mississippi River valleys, valleys. And in those areas, it may be as many as 60% or 70 or 80% of people have contracted that illness. Now for most people, it's asymptomatic. Um, the body deals with this organism that's inhaled through the lungs. It's engulfed by the white blood cells called uh, macrophages that then go back to the lymph node bearing areas of the body where unfortunately this disease can just remain in a very, very smoldering latent stage. And then only when people become immunosuppressed either later in disease just because they're getting older or they've become a, a transplant patient or we give them immunosuppressive uh, medications because of their arthritis or their psoriasis or what have you, then this disease can reactivate and cause uh, real problems. And so this is an important one for folks to know a little bit about. Um, again, this is mainly in soil that's been contaminated with bird or bat droppings. And then uh, when the, the soil is stirred up, and as you mentioned, this can be anybody who's out there working in their garden, uh, farmers who are plowing the fields, people who are doing demolition or renovation work, uh, where they're tearing out walls that, again, may be contaminated with this type of material, and then they can uh, get exposed to the disease. We do see a certain number of folks with a heavy dose of the inhalation that can cause pulmonary disease that we can uh, recognize and treat. But again, one of the more common phenomenon is later on when people get immunosuppressed that they develop disease. Now in other parts of the country, in the, the Southwest, there's a disease that's called coccidiomycosis. And again, this is by inhalation of dust that's been contaminated with the spores of that fungus. 
Again, just like histoplasmosis, you can get an inhalational disease. It's actually called valley fever or San Joaquin Valley fever in many places. And uh, most people are able to deal with that successfully. Their immune system is able to uh, ward off that disease. And then unfortunately, later on in life, when they become immunosuppressed, it can again uh, raise its ugly head. There's another fungal disease that I just want to mention so that your viewers have heard about it called cryptococcosis. Again, this is a disease that we see sometimes in bat or bird uh, contaminated soil that then gets inhaled and can cause disease in, in immunosuppressed uh, patients. Mm -hmm. So pretty much lots of different parts of the country can give you inhalational disease from fungal spores um, that are you know, in the soil and again can be stirred up when people are doing their occupational or, or recreational activities. Is this and these you know, can be particularly important, uh, if I can add that as a you know, nearly recovering chest surgeon, mm -hmm. that sometimes they cause abnormalities in chest x-rays that can be long lasting. They can look like little nodules and P-shaped areas uh, on a chest x-ray and sometimes they can be confused for a small lung tumor. And it's not uncommon to end up having to biopsy or take one of these tiny nodules out, particularly if they're newly appearing. Now, in certain parts of the country where these fungal infections are common, uh, they're taken for granted a lot more and they're frequently followed over a period of time. And if they're not growing, they're considered to be benign and of no concern and only if they grow. But I do want our viewers to know that sometimes they do get confused with small lung cancers. Mm. It's absolutely true. And that's not an unusual scenario in the clinic that we have is a patient that's referred because of a lung nodule that may then go on to biopsy. They might be thinking that it's cancerous only to find what we call a, a caseating granuloma uh, with yeast forms oftentimes seen uh, by the pathologist when they look at it under the microscope. And then they're referred to our clinic to decide do they need additional treatment or perhaps the nodule's been removed and they really have no problems. Heck of a lot better than being diagnosed with lung cancer. That's Absolutely. Right. I always. Uh, uh, you know, appreciate being able to tell a patient that they've got something that's readily treatable and that uh, we have good medicines for and that they're not going to have to go under the surgeon's knife. <laughs> okay, I want to go back to the phones in just a moment, but I do have to ask you, are there preventative measures that we can take? Would a mask help in this situation? In general, um, you know, when people uh, are just in their normal uh, healthy state, there's probably not a lot that can be done. When somebody's immunosuppressed, clearly they don't want to increase their risk of exposure. So wearing a mask or just avoiding those situations as much as possible would, uh, would be what would be recommended. Uh, but, you know, again, this is endemic in those areas. All of us are breathing dust and material on a daily basis. So there's uh, not a great deal sometimes that can be done. But if you're going to be uh, clearly in a, a hyper endemic area where you're cleaning an area that's obviously been contaminated with bird droppings, then absolutely you want to take some precautions, wear a mask, be careful. Um, sometimes you can moisten the area to keep the, the fungal spores from uh, flying up in the air and then inhaling them. Okay, excellent. Okay, we're going to go back to the phones. Thanks for your patience. Glenn from North Carolina, you're up next. Yes, sir. Uh, I've been uh, diagnosed with a disease called Alpha Gal, and they said it comes from the bite of a long star tick, a tick which has a white spot on his back. I have all the symptoms that y'all have been talking about. I'm allergic to red meat. I can only eat chicken and uh, seafood. Uh, I've been probably uh, close to 10 years now. Sometimes I, before I found out the trouble about the red meat, every time I'd go out and eat a steak, uh, within five or six hours I'd be in the emergency room, but I didn't tie it together. And uh, I've been to Duke Medical Center. I've been everywhere. And I'm just looking for some help. I, I want to know if there's... Uh, what I need to do or where I need to go because it's a miserable disease. I mean, you break out all over. Sometimes my face swells up. You can't even get, tell who I am. I mean, it's, uh, and this has been going on for a long time. I've tried about every medicine that they have, and, uh, and I, I just want to find out is where I need to go or what I need to do. Well, Glenn, it sounds like you've been through a really hard time with this and through a lot of uh, careful diagnostic testing as well as a number of, uh, of therapies uh, to try to make you feel better. So, Mark, what do you think? Time to think about another diagnosis or, uh, or is, is this consistent? 
No, it sounds like um, his physicians have done a good job with uh, making the diagnosis, uh, again, with this alpha-gal uh, allergy. And, um, you know, the, the, the obvious recommendation would be avoiding those things that trigger the allergic reaction, so trying to avoid uh, meat consumption. Um, obviously, there's good ways of getting protein outside of uh, mammalian meat, and so I think that, unfortunately, that's going to be what Glenn has to, uh, has to do. Fortunately, many of us like good steak, so that could be a problem for poor Glenn. Yeah. Okay, we're going to go to Terry from Delaware. You're our next caller, Terry. Thanks for joining the conversation tonight. Thank you, Christine. Um, my question is, my husband's been on an antibiotic for, for more than two weeks. He's off of it. It has not resolved the problem of the bite. We wanted to know if we need to go another step up and go to an infectious disease or be back on the antibiotic. Terry, could you tell us a little bit more about the bite? Do you know whether it was a mosquito bite or a tick bite or a spider bite and uh, specifically uh, the name of the disease or the name of the antibiotic that your husband's being treated with? That could help us uh, think through this a little bit more. Okay, yes, it was a tick bite. Um, and he was on doxycycline, um, and it, it did not. It wasn't a bullseye type of mark, but it was a big red mark, and it kept growing and growing. And he finally put. They finally put him on the um, doxycycline on June, the, July the 18th. So, I, what I would recommend, uh, Terry, is that uh, potentially. The treatment for a tick bite like this where you're suspecting Lyme disease, it's too early in the course of the disease to necessarily clinch the diagnosis by doing the blood test that we talked about earlier in the program. The general course for treating acute Lyme disease would be two to perhaps three weeks of an antibiotic. Uh, you could potentially go back to your clinician, ask for the full three-week course of therapy, and then I think you're going to have to be patient for a little while and see if those symptoms uh, resolve. Obviously, if they're, if they're really getting worse and you're worried about it, you could go back and, and clearly get a second opinion on this. But, um, you know, I would give it a little bit more time and then maybe repeat a blood test, uh, you know, a month or two later to see if you've really developed antibodies towards the Lyme uh, disease and that would clinch your diagnosis. You know, that sounds very reasonable, but Terry, our advice always is that if you think there's something else going on or if you're concerned uh, that he may be getting worse in one way or another, it's always good to make a phone call to your health care professional or stop by the local emergency room if you're really that concerned and just uh, share what's going on uh, with the professionals and see what they think. And because, you know, there, there could be two separate things that are going on uh, with very different types of treatment necessary. Yeah, that's certainly true, Dr. Gold, and we don't want to be making uh, diagnoses uh, over the phone in people that we haven't seen and misleading them. So, uh, again, if there are real causes for concern, then clearly uh, seeking medical attention is the best advice. Okay, excellent guidance, gentlemen. Thank you for that, and thank you for that call, Terry. Let's move on and talk about exposure from working with livestock and other animals. What do we need to keep in mind here? Yeah, so, Christina, great question, and uh, clearly... These are diseases that are not as prevalent as some of the things that we've already talked about. But if you're working on the farm or in the ranch and you're exposed to livestock, there are going to be a number of diseases that you can get from that animal exposure. Uh, a number of those would be uh, coxiella. Uh, this is our otherwise known as Q fever. And then there's another one that's uh, called brucellosis. There are only a few hundred cases of those per year in the United States, but clearly uh, they can be very serious and certain things that, that ranchers want to know about. Uh, tularemia can likewise be transmitted uh, from a variety of animals. So these are things that uh, clearly your ranchers want to know about. Now Q fever is kind of interesting because uh, Q stands for query. And so when this was initially described, they actually didn't know what the cause was of it, and that's why it caused so many queries. Um, this is caused by a, a bacteria called Coxiella burnettii. This is a pretty hardy environmental organism that is really concentrated 
in the birth fluids of animals. And so if there's a rancher out there that's working with cattle and sheep during the season when they're giving birth, they need to be uh, at least aware of this illness uh, because it can be very concentrated in those fluids. It can stay in the environment after the environment's been contaminated. And then you can get inhalation of that organism later on. Uh, it can cause a febrile illness, a pneumonia, occasionally can uh, strike the liver and cause hepatitis, infect the bone, which we call osteomyelitis, or in rare instances cause a disease on the heart valves called endocarditis. So all those are pretty scary words and pretty serious illness. Uh, so folks who work around animals and get a febrile disease that doesn't clear up by itself after a few days, it's probably prudent to go in and seek medical attention. Now, brucella is another one that we talked about, and brucellosis is even less common now than coxiella or Q fever. And the reason for that is largely because the vaccination campaign that we've done in livestock has been so effective. So this used to be a very common disease in rural America amongst folks who had exposure to livestock. Now it's relatively rare. And actually where we're seeing it more frequently is in the wild animal population. Uh, so people who are hunters and they're out uh, with wild game might be more exposed to this than uh, actually our ranchers nowadays. Uh, there continues to be some controversy over some of the wild animals that are protected, like the bison, for instance, reintroducing brucella into, uh, into our livestock. And then one other thing that I would mention is that people who like to consume unpasteurized milk or dairy products are putting themselves at risk for this mm -hmm. disease because it can live in, those, uh, in the milk and in the cheese that hasn't been pasteurized. They can ingest it and get an illness in that manner. Wow. Again, this is a febrile disease, oftentimes with some muscle aches and some other systemic symptoms that can go on for a quite a long period of time. And that's one of the tricky things with brucellosis is that you can get a chronic phase of the disease that can go on sometimes for, for months. Okay. And then, as I mentioned, uh, one other disease I'll just uh, very briefly deal with is called tularemia. Uh, this is a disease that's kind of interesting because it can be spread by a tick bite, but it also there's a form of the disease that you can get from direct inoculation. So typically we divide tularemia into tick-borne disease or rabbit-borne disease, although it can be transmitted by a variety of other uh, rodents. And then um, you get it from the bite of the tick, or if a hunter has killed an animal and they're preparing uh, the animal uh, hide or the, the carcass, if they nick themselves with the knife that they're using, they can inoculate tularemia in that manner. And then uh, something that Dr. Gold is very interested in with regard to uh, Nebraska medicine being a site for biopreparedness, Tularemia is actually a disease that has been targeted as a potential weapon of bioterrorism because you can weaponize it, cause inhalational disease, which can cause a very serious pneumonia. So a very interesting disease can be spread in a variety of ways in a number of animal reservoirs, but something that your viewers need to be aware of. Absolutely. Just critical information. Now, we only have about a minute left. I want to give you both an opportunity to share your final th th thoughts briefly for our viewers out there. Go ahead, Dr. Gold. Well, I just want to take this opportunity to thank you and uh, all of our friends at uh, Rural America uh, Live for putting this program on. We're always interested in what you, our viewers, want to hear about. Uh, what's new, what's different, what you want some awareness of. We're at UNMC Webmaster at unmc.edu, and we want to hear your questions. We want to know what we should be working on for future shows with you. Okay, well, this certainly was a good one. Dr. Rupp, you were fantastic. <laughs> the rock star of infectious disease knowledge. Really appreciate having you both on as always. And we get to do this about once a month with UNMC. Thank you for watching. Really appreciate you for joining us on Rural America Live. Good night from Rural America's most important network.